Um, well, first, thanks uh, for that, Chris, but I do have one little correction. Um, technically, uh, I was not in Burma, um, but yeah, I heard about Schumacher's work in Burma, but anyone who spent time in that part of Asia, uh, borders don't really exist anywhere, so uh, anyway, I was in the neighborhood. <laughs> um, but I did hear about Schumacher's work in Burma. And then I either got the book, Small is Beautiful, when I was first in Southeast Asia or just when I got back. So I, I can't remember if I had picked up the book before I got home or not. Um, Schumacher has been an influential person in, in my life and in, in my journey. Uh, to start with, he had impeccable credentials as an economist. He was a Rhodes Scholar in economics from Germany, studying in England, of course. Uh, he had a working relationship with John Maynard Keynes. Um, in fact, when the war started, he was in an internment camp, and he had written something that somehow ended up on Keynes's desk. And Keynes put it in a mass publication he was doing. Everyone thought Keynes wrote it, and Keynes was horrified that he didn't get credit. Uh, but anyway, they had a long-term relationship and he got uh, Schumacher a teaching position at Oxford. Um, he was top economist and planner for the British Wolf Board, which is one of the largest industrial boards in England at the time. And he was an economic advisor to the British Control Commission in Germany. And what they did after World War II is they rebuilt the German economy. And he was in charge of statistics, and he was one of the planners for putting together Germany's economy after World War II. So he comes with impeccable credentials. Um, but he was also outside the box. He was president of the Soil Association, which is the oldest and largest organic farming organization in the world. Uh, as already mentioned, he had worked in Burma, and I'll talk about some of that work. Um, he was founder of a, of a group called the Intermediate Technology Development Group, and again, I'll talk more about that as well. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Schumacher is he's outside of capitalism and socialism. So if you're here to get uh, nuggets to join the conversation around us, uh, Schumacher's not your guy, because he thinks both sides are equally wrong, because they share a common group of assumptions of which he is going to reject. He's going to reject all the foundational assumptions on both sides of this argument. Um, he's been called the, the Keynes of post-industrial society. So he's arguing uh, in the short run that while we may be able to survive for a short period of time, the science of economics as it's currently put together uh, cannot continue long term. It's destined to fail because of the assumptions. Um, as most of you know, um, he wrote in the 1960s uh, and 70s. Um, but interestingly enough, I think you'll find many of these ideas have not become outdated yet. One of his major themes is bigness is an enemy. Bigness in all kinds of organizations. In any kind of organization, size is an independent factor we have to look at, independent of anything else. And as most of you probably know, uh, with the economy of scale, everything tends to get bigger in, in the way that modern economists think because of the eco economics of scale. Schumacher is going to argue that with bigness comes the impersonal, both within an organization and outside having to deal with one. 
It's insensitive to anything uh, outside of its basic uh, set of criteria that it's interested in. It lusts to concentrate power and control in all areas that it is responsible for. Schumacher also points out that there's a real dark side to the emerging technological world. On the other hand, for Schumacher, small is beautiful, uh, it's free. And we'll talk more about what he means by that. It's ultimately efficient because it's small groups working together to accomplish their own independent needs. It's creative because you're trying to solve your creative local solution. You're trying to solve your local problems. It's enjoyable. It's creative. That isn't, those aren't usually the descriptors of work we think of in a, mo in a modern economic system. And that's going to be one of the hearts of the matter that we're going to get to in his critique. Um, so Schumacher embraces a communal village kind of community structure. And he argues that handcrafts and craftsmanship, a tribal way of life, that lifestyle is as old as Neolithic cultures. And he argues that human beings were designed to live in a culture more like that than the one we have. His book made the list of the 100 top books since World War II, list put together by the New York Times. And that will be very interesting. When we get to the end, um, there's a real irony in, in the reception of his book and who it was received by. Um, as you might expect, he's going to reject uh, the usual definition of progress that's given by modern economists. And that is, more stuff is better. He argues that economic and technological developments unleash cataclysmic social change. And it results in demoralizing most people in the societies and making them feel totally helpless. So they have to depend on the rich and the experts to solve their problems. Interesting that he saw this in 1960s when he first wrote this. So, first I'd like to give just a little bit of background on economics that, uh, that I think will help us understand what Schumacher's project is. Economics really became a science in 1969. Um, before that, it was really kind of considered a pseudoscience. Um, in 69, I was taking an economics class from a, an economics prof who sometimes didn't show up because he had to go talk to a president, and he'd talked to presidents since uh, Eisenhower. His name was Alan Mandelstam, and he called himself Handsome Al. He was five foot five, 300 pounds. He tended to waddle. Um, he was a showman, uh, and his classes were incredibly well attended. They were in auditoriums that would seat 650 and there was television for 2,000, one of those kind of classes. And he'd get up there and start waxing about economics or something or if it looked like most people were bored, he'd start teaching us how to dance, do the mamba, and he'd pull out three or four uh, yo-yos and be doing three or four yo-yos at a time. Anyway, real showman. But for the life of me, I can't remember this lecture. I'd give anything to have a copy of it. But I don't remember what he said on this day in 1969. I'd give anything to have it because it'd be great. But he came in and he'd come in and he'd say, Kiddies, <laughs> today is a milestone in economics. We have arrived. 
We now wear the black robes of authority in this culture. We now are going to really uh, exert an influence and we are going to accomplish the goals that we've set before ourselves. So kiddies, buckle in. This is going to be great. Well, anyway, what happened in 1969? The Nobel Committee established a Nobel Prize for economics in 1969. That's what he was talking about. For him, that's when a science arrives, when there's now a category that you get a Nobel Prize for it. Well, how had economics finally gotten to this point is it had become quantitative enough that you could ask hypotheses and do statistical tests. That's why economics became a science. So in his view, and in all economists, this is going to be central to the whole thing. Every social science wanted to be a real science, like physics. Everybody is envious of physics. Physics and chemistry, they're to be emulated. I mean, they're the pinnacle. Economics was always a pseudoscience, along with ecology and biology. Th they're all pseudoscience. And by that, they mean it operates like physics. Ultimately, what's at the bottom is mindless atoms. And we can predict the laws of movements of mindless atoms. What's happening here is economics is now modeling itself after physics. Schumacher is going to have a great deal of the difficulty and problems with the assumptions that come along with that assumption about what the science of economics is. So, let's start. Economics deals with goods and services from the viewpoint of a market. Okay, there's a lot of jargon in here. But a market Historically, a market would be, say, in a Greek city-state. Everybody would go to the market and dicker for what they needed. That was the market. And you'd go to somebody's stand and you'd dicker over the prices. And if you didn't like that, you'd go to the next stand and dicker with them. But in economics, we came up with a new category called a commodity. What a commodity is, is a unified product that we're now going to sell in a market, and a market is not now a city. It can be maybe a state early, but it became national in the 19th century, and starting in the early 20th century, markets became international. So we're developing these ideas of commodities. So, a buyer wants the best value for his money, and he's not concerned about where it came from or the conditions under which it was produced. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is the price, because all commodities are identical. So, for example, Marx is a good example of someone who held this kind of a perspective. Marx said, Wheat tastes the same whether it comes from England, Germany, or Russia. It's all the same. Wheat's wheat. We don't care where it comes from. We don't care what conditions under which it was grown. Why would we care? The only thing we care about is the price. So, um, that's beginning to lay the groundwork uh, for economics. So one of the first points I want to make is if, if an economist was going to go to Burma, no modern economist would think that a Burmese way of life is going to call for Buddhist economics. Economics is economics. If economics is really a science, 
then we're dealing with invariable laws that are true in every culture. We don't have to deal with cultural stuff. Economics is economics wherever you are. I mean, if economics is a science like physics, that's true, right? I mean, things don't differ in the northern hemisphere from southern hemisphere, or at least mostly. So, but anyway, the assumption here is that once economics became a science, scientists always seem to fall prey to thinking that their science is based on absolutes and invariable truths, and there's no presuppositions at all. We're just looking at stuff and doing empirical experiments and testing laws. It's all the same. So the idea that there would be a Buddhist way of life that would have anything to do with economics, that's crazy. That's crazy making. To some ecologists, or sorry, to some economists, the economic laws are as free and from metaphysics and values as is gravity, and they would make that claim. There's no assumptions, nothing of value we're, we're claiming. It's all absolute truths. Well, Schumacher, in his book, Small is Beautiful, basically is going to uh, not only disagree with every fundamental assumption in the science of uh, economics model, he's, he's going to fundamentally point out that everyone is not just wrong, but fundamentally wrong. So, he starts, the first principle of economic theory is gross domestic product uh, per capita is the fundamental measure. That's what every, uh, what every economist wants to know. Is the economy of a country growing or is it getting smaller? Higher is always better. What are the implications of this as Schumacher starts to unravel them here? A person who consumes the most is better off, right? And this view came to us from the Enlightenment. Think back to what the Enlightenment project was. We're setting aside the medieval Christianity and concerns about that stuff what we're going to do now is through science and technology, we're going to solve the production problem and we're going to provide the world with all the stuff they can possibly imagine and we will solve every human problem. That's the Enlightenment project, which became the modern project. So the economists are absolutely right in line with that project. That is the project. As Schumacher points out, consumption is the sole end and purpose of all economic activity. That's all economics is, is buying and selling. Schumacher says, to begin with, this is wrong. There's a possibility of pathological growth, unhealthy growth, or disruptive growth. growth isn't, by definition, always good. Schumacher is going to argue for a different principle. Maximum well-being should be the goal with a minimum of consumption. In his mind, that ought to be the goal of economics. We maximize our well-being with a minimum of consumption. Why is he concerned about this? Well, a lot of products are made with materials that in the end become exhaustible. If you're going to continue to build more and more and more goods and stuff, sooner or later you're going to run out of resources that are finite. Meaning, this model of economics is not sustainable. At some point, and he argued in the not too distant future, it's going to end. One of the things that Schumacher argued is, since all an economist is interested in is the market, 
it things that aren't privately owned, like air, water, soil, living nature, all of that stuff, has no place in economics. So initially, it had absolutely no place in economics. Because if you don't own it, and you can't buy it and sell it in the market, we can't tally up quant quantified what it's worth. It's not in the models. It's not in any of the measures. Schumacher also points out that there's no analysis of human needs or aspirations in this model. So for example, uh, this was a time that man landed on the moon. This was a time that people were pursuing whether to build a supersonic transport, the Concorde. His argument was, where was the debate about what we want? What do we want our national, what's our national goal here for our well-being? Who's deciding that and on what basis? Now I'd like to turn to the heart of the matter. And, and this is a, a chapter, I think it's chapter five, um, called Buddhist Economics. And it's his most famous chapter in the book. And uh, most of this analysis that I'm gonna do for a little while comes out of this chapter. So the classic economics model here is the fundamental source of wealth is human labor. Work is a necessary evil. So for example, we start with Adam Smith's pin factory. So you got a guy making pins and he can make two or three pins a day. But if you divide the pin making up into 18 tasks where one person's doing this all day, suddenly 18 people can make 10,000 pins in a day. That's the foundation of the classical economic system. If you can build three pins a day, that's how much money you're going to make. But if we can make thousands of pins in a day, man, we can be rich. That's the foundation of all economic thinking. It's a law. So. For an employer, work is to be avoided or minimized, and you want to mechanize it wherever you can. So you don't want to be paying anybody to be making stuff wherever you can. So an employer, employers want output without any employees. That's their goal. But an employee, for an employee, work is to be avoided if at all possible. If I can get paid for doing nothing, that's the ideal. I mean, that is it. That's the pinnacle of arriving. In other words, the worker all wants income without being employed. So Schumacher looks at this and goes, well, it looks like it's a good thing to get rid of work because nobody wants it. Automation is always good. Specialization reduces a task to a series of steps, and the work of that is just mind-numbing labor. Anybody that's ever worked on an assembly line knows what I'm talking about. Just imagine doing one step, <laughs> eight hours a day, mind-numbing labor. So all work is mind-numbing. So the worker wants really high wages to compensate for this work. So they're paid the wages to work. Schumacher now is going to respond as a Buddhist, as the people in Burma responded to this. First, to organize work as meaningless labor, which is boring, stultifying, nerve-wracking, that's little short of criminal, and you should be prosecuted for it. 
it suggests a greater concern for goods than people. And we'll see this is a recurring theme in most all of these assumptions. It values goods more than people. It's a soul destroying, it also produces a soul destroying degree of attachment to stuff. It makes all of life the accumulation of stuff. So in Schumacher's mind, to strive for leisure as an, as an alternative to work, that's equally as bad from the perspective of developing human beings into the people they ought to be. We need to stop and think about what it truly means to exist as a human being. For a Buddhist, work and leisure can't be separated without destroying the other. There can't be work and leisure by itself. They come together as a pair. They have to be understood as a complement. So, According to the Buddhists, then, what's the function of work? So to a Buddhist, it gives man a chance to utilize and develop his faculties. One of the things it gives him an opportunity to do is learn a skill as a craftsman. That you should learn a skill, something that's yours, that you take on and develop, and you produce products that you're proud of. That's a fundamental need for the existence of a human being. Second, it's an opportunity to overcome ego-centeredness by joining others in common tasks. Yeah, you have to learn to work with others, local people. Remember, this is built on the level of a village. This is people interacting with people you've grown up with your whole life. And you're creating goods and services that people in your community really need. You're not making stuff for some unknown person in who knows what part of the world. That'd be idiotic. Why would you do that? No Buddhist would ever do that. That's a complete misunderstanding of what human existence is about. To a classical economist, full employment has been a debate since the days of Ricardo, for sure, Malthus and others. So for economists, they do highly sophisticated calculations on whether full employment pays or not or whether it's more economical to run a level of unemployment, say 5%, to ensure that there's enough people around to be changing jobs. Because see, if there's full employment and then a new opportunity comes along, there isn't workers to take that on. So basically in economics, there's a rule of thumb. When you look at the unemployment rate, you want to see it at 5%. That's optimal. Because in, this, in all these calculations, the only measure that counts is the quantity of goods sold. Because that's the only measure in economics, the quantity of goods sold. And you can sell more goods when you run unemployment. 5% or more. They've done the calculations and it's beneficial to pay people to be unemployed to pay them well enough so they can sustain themselves as a customer buying stuff. That's what it's about. To the Buddhist, this line of reasoning is standing truth on its head. For certain here, goods are more important than people. It's inescapable. Consumption is more important than learning a skill and being part of a community. 
It shifts the focus from developing as a person to producing and primarily consuming. That's what we are. We're consumption units. That's what economists call people, consumption units. A classical economist looking at transportation. The measure is increase in tons per mile per person. That's economic progress. The more tons per mile per capita, that's a measure of the health of an economic system. To the Buddhist, this is absolutely as absurd. As I already said, it's illogical to produce anything for unknown people. And local products sh should be for local people. Nothing should move. Not too surprisingly, most organic farm, the idea of organic farming ideas and Saturday markets, uh, Schumacher is one of the founders of that sort of an idea as a backlash against scientific economics. And just a comment that I'll make here, one of the comments Schumacher makes about all economists, they're college educated, they're urban, they know nothing about land, soil, or farming at all, and yet they're telling us what's economic and not economic, you know, what's economic and not economic which he argues is a pretty sad state of affairs. But the economists do wear the black robes now. They are the experts and the authorities. Okay, so the idea of, of classical economics was fast transport and instant communication are supposed to open up whole new vistas of freedom. Schumacher argues in 1965 that instead this is going to destroy freedom, make things more vulnerable and less secure all the way around. That what they're claiming they're building is all this increased freedom, stability and whatever, and it's a crystal chandelier on the Titanic is Schumacher's argument. It's a system that we've gained so much trust in. I'll point this out now that when Schumacher said, here's how he wanted to approach Burma. Keep everything at the, well, uh, I'll tell you this story first. He went to Burma as head of an economic council whose aim was to build a series of dams and electrify Burma like the TVA did in America, Tennessee Valley Association. He got there, and he was there for like two weeks, and said, they don't need any of this. In fact, if we build it, it destroys their, econ it destroys their culture. What they need is a pump that works to lift water into a rice paddy. The technology they need is not a 100, mega, 100 megawatt power dam. What they need is a pump that will function that they can put a bicycle on to pedal it to move water and still use their bicycle. And he found a Burmese engineer who helped him build the pump and he set him up in business. The word in Asia at the time I was there was Schumacher is the only white man who ever treated an Asian equal. It's never occurred in the history of our dealing with Southeast Asia where we treated them as equals. Classical economic, or economics now. Let's go to education. This is easy. What's education for? We all know this. It's for job training. That's what economics, uh, that's what education's for. You want to get educated to get the best technical job so that you're the most important cog in the machine. That's who makes the money, and that's what this is about, being able to consume. To a Buddhist, the task of education is to learn what's ultimately valuable, and to learn means to live a good life. 
In the classical, in the classical economist model, science techno and technology can meet any challenge. And they'd argue we've met every challenge so far. We've solved the production problem. We can produce as much anything as we possibly can use. And that was the goal of this project set 500 years ago in the Enlightenment. Through science and technology, we'll make the stuff that solves all the human dilemmas. They're just doing it. They're just, they're just successfully completing that project that was started. There's a guy named Julius Simon. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of him or not, a professor at Yale. And he has argued for the last 50 years that we need to be increasing our population. Why? To create the demand so technology will respond. Technology will respond to any increase in population or any increase in demand. What we need to progress is increased demand. We can meet any goal. This is one of the leading top economists in the country from Yale. And he's been around since the 1960s. OK, Schumacher, technologies in crisis. It's human nature to revolt against inhuman technology and these organizational patterns that reduce everything down to this mind-numbing exercise. Look, look at jobs in most organizations. You're given a book. Here's your job or your job description. This is what you do. This is your cog in this organization. If it's not in your book, it's not your job. It's somebody else's job. Technology removes skillful work with the hands first. When technology begins to develop in any field, the first thing it removes are the skilled craftsmen. It destroys that human endeavor. Living environments break down. There's no concern in the economics for anything with regard to land, water, air. It's not there because it isn't known by anybody. It's free. So technology is using up non-renewable resources. And again, what's Julia Simon say about that? What he has said is all along, the technology will either improve so much that even though there's not much of it around, we can still economically provide it to you. Or once we get to a point where it can't, there'll be a new technology, guaranteed. It's happened every time. Um, so Schumacher, permanent limitless expansion in a finite environment can't last. I mean, ecology 101, <laughs> economics 101. Mass production technology is inherently violent, economically damaging, and self-defeating. That virtually all mass production, all mass production technology. I already talked about Schumacher and the pump and his treatment in Southeast Asia. Now I, so in his chapter on Buddhist economics, just sort of see what he's set up. He's articulated what the basic assumptions are in economics. And he ought to know. He's a Rhodes Scholar in economics, and he's got impeccable degrees in economics. And he worked with Keynes, who was leading one of the leading 20th century economists. These, this is the way economics works. When we hear economic news, it's all presented today by people who hold these same assumptions yet. The assumptions of the science of economics have not fundamentally changed. So classical economics is built on materialism. That's the philosophical underpinning of it. So its assumption is that through science and technology, we'll solve all the human problems. 
because all human problems are material. Major assumption, but accepted by every science. Materialism is the foundation of physics, biology. So for instance, in biology, go down here to the biology department, life itself reduces to the product, reduces to chemistry and physics. All we need to know is genetics and biochemistry. In the department down here, there's no reason to have anybody that works in biology above that level, like cell or above, because everything is ultimately caused in biochemist at the biochemical level or um, the genetics level. That's the foundation of materialism. Keynes. Keynes acknowledges that the foundation of the market is selfishness, greed, and it indulges in an orgy of envy. That that has to be the driver in economics. Why is that? I want to go all the way back to Adam Smith to tell you why. 1776, when Adam Smith published his book, here's the way he analyzed economics. In the rural area, we produce food and wood. These are the things that are necessary for sustaining life. The cities produce luxuries. They aren't really needed for life. Well, think about this for a minute. This, this is economics as Adam Smith thought about it. And that was basically true. Now think about this for a minute. The depression of 1929 and 1930 25 or 30 percent of the people were out of work, so 25 or 30 percent of the, of the economy of the country was down. Okay? But if virtually all of what's being produced are luxury items that nobody fundamentally really needs to live, what if everybody decided we aren't going to buy those anymore? Tomorrow the economy's gone. That's where Keynes is coming from. Selfishness, greed, indulgence, and an orgy of envy. Look at marketing. It's all aimed to convince us to buy products that some of them we never heard of and never even had a need for, but they convince us we need it. That's all part of what's absolutely essential to keep this boat afloat. Okay, here's the most interesting part about the foundation of economics that I find most inter interesting and wanna, and this is kind of the high point. It's this quote that I gave you. Now where is this quote from? It's from Small is Beautiful, but chapter five is Buddhist economics. Or is it? Yeah. Oh, it's four. Okay. Where this quote comes from is the last paragraph of chapter three. So this paragraph is setting the context for the, his chapter on Buddhist economics. So I want to read it, and you can look at it. Economics is a derived science which has to accept instructions from what I call meta-economics, meaning he's claiming if you're in Burma, you've got to accept whatever their assumptions are with regard to economics. As the instructions are changed, so changes the content of economics. In the following chapter, we shall explore what economic laws and what definitions of concepts, economic and uneconomic result, and what meta-economic basis for Western materialism is abandoned and the teaching of Buddhism is put in its place. It's the next sentence. The choice of Buddhism for this purpose is purely incidental. The teaching of Christianity, Islam, or Judaism could be used just as well as those of any other great Eastern tradition. 
His point is, I didn't have to call it Buddhist. I could have called this Christian economics. I could have called this Indian economics. I could have called it Islam economics. Any religious context would, would put people before goods and would consider work and human development of character more important than goods. He was asked, why did you call it Buddhist economics? Here's what he said, because if I had called it Christian economics, nobody would have read it. <laughs> and he, he was serious. Because this book made the top 100 list because Christians accepted it? Are you kidding? The book was a counterculture book. This is his point, is if Christianity really is true, and if it's providing the foundational assumptions for economics, we're going to get the same ones we, he did with the Buddhists. Christians haven't paid a great deal of attention to the impact of Christianity it seems to me, on the science of economics. It seems to me that we've spent most of our time fighting over capitalism and socialism, both which accept all these materialistic assumptions, all of them. His point is, and it was his point in the 60s, this whole argument between capitalists and socialism amounts to nothing because it's nothing that, that's really relevant to human beings. Anyway, it seems to me that that's the fundamental connection here between economics and Christianity. Economics, like all is based on a set of presuppositions. Every science that's been put together since the Enlightenment for the modern period is built on a philosophy of materialism. And as a result, all the consequences are purely material. We see them all the time. Human beings, what are we? We're just matter, matter in motion. So it seems to me that ultimately Schumacher was an economist with impeccable credentials, but he didn't use them just for power, prestige, and money. He didn't use them just to be famous <coughs> and to gain uh, the wealth to be able to consume at an unlimited level. He challenged the very assumptions that the science of economics is built on from the beginning. Pointed out they're all materialistic. No one denies it. No one's ever denied it. And he said, all those assumptions in the end make goods more important than people. And all we got to do is look around. And as I say, this is written in the 60s and 70s, 50 and 60 years ago. So replacing materialism with Christianity as an assumption of economics ought to yield a very different picture of economics and ought to lead to a very different picture of how we ask the questions of how should we live life? What do we value? And I think those are the importance that Schumacher brought to an argument. And as I say, this book is not in economics curriculums, for the most part. There's a few that look at it, but it's uh, basically derogatory because all economics is built on the material system. Those are the inviolable laws that have been built in economics. Those can't be questioned. And so for Christians, I think it raises the issue with regard to economics. It is like I say in, in the 60s, Schumacher said, it's a waste of time to get into capitalism, socialism, any of those kind of arguments, because they all fundamentally miss the boat. Because they all agree 
on the fundamental assumptions and what the science of economics is. Um, I will just say that at the time I became aware of this, I was not a believer. Um, and in fact, I had never in my life run into a Christian who would make this kind of argument. And that was the impediment for me to even consider Christi Christianity as a possibility. Because anybody who knows who I am, I grew up in an agricultural area, organic farming. I'm a stream ecologist by training. None of my values are anywhere to be found in capitalism or socialism. They're found in these kind of economics. Economics built on small scale villages, people, interaction. The last thing I'll, I'll make is, I think the most interesting, is an economist responded to when, when, when Schumacher came back from Burma, he gave a talk somewhere, I don't remember the details of it now, but he laid out this view that he wanted to start and maintain the village system in Burma and build small technologies to just help them produce more food, be able to move water easier. The first comment from the leading economist who attended it said, that's a formula for starvation. And I don't know what he said back, but I guess what I would say is this. Notice when we had snow for three days, how much food was left on the shelves in Eugene? Let's talk about a formula for starvation. Because the economics we have is a system built on transportation from everywhere in the globe. It's global now, the market is now global. And so all our stuff is coming from who knows where. Anyway, um, as I say, it seems to me the strongest part of Schumacher is his ability to look at the science of economics and the assumptions it's built on and just to ask the question, what would it look like to have an economic system where people actually mattered? And I'll end there. So I guess we got a little time for questions, right? <laughs> uh, I have a couple of questions. Kay. One might be easier to answer. What's the relationship between uh, Schumacher and um, Burdick? Because in The Ugly American, mm -hmm. he tells that story about the bicycle and the rice fields. Right. And he's um, got a character that sounds yes. a lot like Schumacher. Well, it, it's <laughs> called The describing. Ugly American. His name, oh shoot. His name was Pops. Oh. And he was in Burma. Or sorry, excuse me. He was in Laos. And he was a retired guy. I've forgotten now. He was about 75 and he, ha he was in bad health. And he decided he was just going to go to Laos. And he was an engineer by training. And he moved into a small village. And that's his story. Okay. Yeah, that's his story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the, the relationship jumped out at me because yes. I read that book maybe just a couple of years ago. Right. It was really powerful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that is one of the major connections with The Ugly. And I, actually, The Ugly American, the title is The Engineer. He's an ugly person to look at. But he's the only American in Southeast Asia who is actually treating the people as equals. Mm. And, but ugly American came to mean the opposite. Americans that go abroad and then somehow no longer stay as Americans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so I at least knew the answer to that one. <laughs> 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 only because I'm a Burdick fan, so. Yeah, big one. <laughs> um, this one's harder. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Probably can't answer that then. <laughs> Just a warning. Um, and less formed as well. But um, 
given this, how do we deal with the system we're in? How do we make um, a living actually, or make yeah. a difference? Or um, well, that's a question I've thought a lot about. Um, and what I would say is we each need to just be aware of what the issues are. And what Schumacher would say is small is beautiful. Uh, got enough space to build a f uh, have a few pots of plants around. I mean, you can start anywhere. On one hand, I'll start there. You can start anywhere. The only question is what you would limit yourself by. Um, I'll, I'll do this. Um, for me, the most influential person in my life was my grandmother. She primarily raised me uh, while my mother was in grad school. So from zero to like five, I was raised by my grandmother. Um, here's my grandmother. She was born in 1880. When she was 17, she got a teaching certificate, came home and said, I'm leaving by myself for the Montana Territory on Monday to homestead and be a school teacher. Let's just say that didn't go down well. <laughs> <laughs> but she went. She was a school teacher and proved her own claim in Montana. Um, she married my grandfather when she was 32. So she homesteaded by herself in the Montana Territory. And, it, well, it had become a state by then. Uh, and was a school teacher. A major motivation was she saw what was happening with Michigan. It was becoming industrial. She didn't want to live in that kind of society. I mean, that's who a lot of homesteaders were. They were people that just said, we don't want to live in this. And in the 1840s, for instance, when industrialization was coming to the United States, there were massive revolts in cities with factories. And what was the claim? They're taking away my freedom. They're making me a slave. <coughs> the workers in 1840 saw this whole economics coming at them as a form of slavery and was taking their freedom away. Um, so uh, on one hand, like I say, we each have our place and where we're at. Um, and so I've just maybe said, here's some sideboards, <laughs> you know. But, but I think the Schumacher principle, we live in a society that says the more we consume, the better. And I think Schumacher's mantra here, or his slogan, let's see how well we can live consuming the least. That, that's a better formula for making different decisions. But it will not go down easy in the culture we live in. Um, in part, because this is what runs the economy. Uh, am I getting at your question? So anyway, as I say, I think the first thing he'd say is small is beautiful. Just make yourself, uh, give yourself the opportunity to pursue opportunities to make you into the person you want to be. And work out the rest of it. So not a very specific answer, but um, but yeah, hopefully that gets at it somewhat. So, yeah, drawing upon the um, idea of the division of labor, I got this quote from John Ruskin, who is a major mm -hmm. force in the arts and crafts movement in England, mm -hmm. seeking to regain the dignity of good workmanship in the face of cheap mass production of the Industrial Revolution. 
So from his essay, The Nature of Gothic, which he was published in 1853, he said, we have much studied and perfected of late the great civilized invention of the division of labor, only we give it a false name. It is not, truly speaking, the labor that is divided, but the men. We are always in these days endeavoring to separate labor and intellect. We want one man to be always thinking and another to be always working, and we want call one a gentleman and the other an operative, whereas the worker ought often to be thinking and the thinker often to be working, and both should be gentlemen in the best sense. As it is, we make both ungentle, the one envying, the other despising his brother, and the mass of society is made up of morbid thinkers and miserable workers. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things that's interesting that comes from that same era, and uh, one of the fascinations I have is uh, before the industrialization hit England, each major county had developed a style of wagon built for their own county. And so over time, it just developed, given the lay of the land, given the crops, given everything, county wagons. So anyone who is knowledgeable and sees a wagon could tell you what county it came from at, a, at like 1840s in England. And the craftsmen had, over time, just learned what the requirements would be best met for the people in this in this particular area, and usually it was county. So would this be the application of what we call of a Surrey, as in being both the county and the uh, wagon, or maybe? No, maybe I don't know. Okay. Oh well. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure about that. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're not familiar with what John Wesley said about economics. Uh, no, probably not. Okay, he said, he said, make as much as you can, save as much as you can, and give away as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And capitalism has been wedded for Christians with philanthropy. And so we have Carnegie yeah. and, you know, making libraries and Rockefeller sure. giving money to creative, you know, sure. endeavors. So, yes. so capitalism is a servant, but it's, we have that, that Seventh-day Adventist to be creative apart from how we work. Um, well, <laughs> yes, I, yeah, no, I, I have heard that quote now, okay. and, and actually, here, here is, um, well, and that's certainly true, um, the idea that uh, we should make money, we should be generous with that money, mm -hmm. and that those are high values. Um, but let's go back to the Old Testament law. The foundation of any principle of economics is not economic efficiency. They were told, go harvest your fields, but hey, don't harvest them clean. Yeah. All of those kind of things. So, so for instance, when I, after my father died, I was running a family farm. And uh, I'm an ecologist. I grew the hedgerows wider for birds and other things. That was an unwise economic decision bordering on immoral because I wasn't using the gifts I'd been given to make as much money as I can for those kind of purposes. But you're giving it away in a sense. To the, to, to the, to the marginal. Yeah, but, but uh, <laughs> yes. So, but there's a personal example, but let me give you another one. Um, I grew up in Michigan, and in the name of economic efficiency, this was where the white pine grew. The dominant sport fish was a salmonid called the Michigan grayling. When they harvested every white pine in this area in 45 years, and then the whole area burned, the dominant sport fish in all these streams, it was the food for people went extinct. Mm -hmm. That was all done in the name of economic efficiency. 
and it was warehousers at all that did this. So it seems to me that pursuit of economic efficiency, even for the purpose of giving this away, Schumacher would argue that that's an immoral decision because you haven't considered the natural world that God built. And we were, our role set up in the garden was we're to take care of the earth. It's in Genesis and nowhere in the Bible does it say that ever changed. Well, it says that, you know, the trade the ten talents. Sure, well. And, and, and to make them grow. Sure. And, and to make them bigger. Sure. And, but and but I, there's a difference. Well, well, I guess all I want to say is, but what's usually, you know, oft, often what's meant by that is we need to be operating on the principles of economic efficiency to make the most money we can to be as generous as we can. Right. And I'm saying that's unbiblical. To, that's be, generous unbiblical. Is, to be generous is unbiblical? No, to be as economically efficient as we can for the purpose of raising this money. That, that in other words, it's kind of like, I would call this rape and pillage. Mm -hmm. So we're going to rape and pillage in the name of giving charity to people. I, it's, see, that, that's what Schumacher has a problem yeah. with, and so do I. You know, I just got back from the, from you know, the Hopis for two months, mm -hmm. and they would drive 70 miles to Walmart mm -hmm. because big was beautiful. I understand. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know what you're saying. They, yeah, th th so, so, I mean, I, small, small, they charge more. So, sure. So they're efficient. Right. And, there's, and everybody right. uses them. So well, what's wrong with Walmart? <laughs> well, yeah, but, but this, comes, this comes back, ultimately this comes back to our principles. And the issue is um, whether economic efficiency is the highest principle. If we decide economic efficiency isn't the highest principle, then okay, I'm going to have less money. I mean, I should still be as charitable as I can, but it's not my job to, cons to, to make the most money I possibly can in my life. If I did, I, for one, wouldn't be a tutor at Gutenberg. Well, if you, if you, but if you made as much as you wanted to, you wouldn't be a <laughs> right. Well, but all I'm saying is, is that in the economic you're giving away your 10%. system, you're giving away your 10%, basically, your tithe. So you're not being efficient. More. Yeah, you're not being efficient. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But what I'm saying is, if economic efficiency is not a Christian value in, in, the, in the economic sense of it. Well, it's, it's not an absolute, but it's, right. it is... It is we're supposed to trade the ten talents. Sure. Okay. We are supposed. Yeah. <laughs> I, I. I mean, I'm not arguing. Well, what I'm arguing is, is that we ought to build an economic system, where our purpose here is to live a life that's meaning meaningful, and we grow as a human being, and we use skills. Those are the purpose of work, and out of that, yes, we obtain money, and out of that, yes, we are to be generous. No question about that. But, um, but what, I'm, what I'm disagreeing with is the perspective that says, it's my job here to be as economically efficient as I can to make the most possible money I can so I can be most generous. I disagree yeah. with that. Yeah, that's John Wesley, so. Yeah, anyway, I disagree with that. And it, I mean, it's part of the Puritan ethic work ethic too, yeah. you know. So sure. that we defer gratification and we try to sure. save and bless others and, yeah. and be a blessing. And that's yes. Abrahamic covenant is to bless others. Sure, absolute agreement. As yeah. I say, I, I had a bad experience with that as being told this is bordering on immoral by growing larger fence rows for birds and other animals when I could be harvesting right to the fences making more money and having more to be generous with. I was told that that was bordering on immoral. Hmm. And I, I disagree. <coughs> so who's building the economy? Uh, I'm sorry? Who's building the economy? Right, you said we need to build an economy that's whatever, 
And this is the concern of more conservative thinking, right, is that centralized power is not helpful. But it seems we have, well, maybe this isn't the case, it seems that we have a decentralized uh, system that still values the wrong sort of thing, possibly. Um, hmm. Well, let me try to get at it this way. Um, Schumacher's arguing small is beautiful. Let's go all the way back to Adam Smith. Adam Smith, and Adam Smith, somebody ought to read him because Adam Smith is great. Adam Smith said, businessmen all want monopolies. I mean, when they get together at a party, they all go in a corner somewhere and figure out how they can make a monopoly because they can make more money then. Every businessman, all through history, that's been their thinking. Here's a rule of thumb. If the 50 largest companies control more than 50% of that product, that's a monopoly according to Smith. I mean, he doesn't say that explicitly, but it comes out about that. Is it in his mind, if, if the government ever lets that go past that, they have failed their, they have failed their responsibility. And look at the mergers of the last couple weeks. Um, same thing with like news. How many corporations control what percent of the media today? It used to be there were a lot of independents and you could buy five or six of them in Eugene from all <coughs> kinds of perspectives. So, so one of the things, um, it seems to me that everything has been centralized and I mean, it depends on what kind of products, but a lot of these products are now global. So what controls all of that? Demand, the demand for them on, in stores. If there's demand for them, they'll show up. If there's not, they'll go away. Uh, anyway, yeah, it's decentralized. Um, the, the problem, uh, well, I, I don't want to necessarily. But is there a more? Is there more or a different part? Yeah. Of your so question? you know, Hayek's concern is we get mm -hmm. we get the government involved. We have a centralized control on how we're going to spend our money or how we're going to direct our economy or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you get the third wreck, right? Like that's right. <laughs> that's that's where he what he's looking at, and. And often the way that um, more conservative sorts of thinkers talk about it is, well, the government is sort of centralizing thing. Like, the government being involved is problematic. But it seems like the problem is bigger than that. It seems like the problem is uh, the, the whatever is the highest right. value, right? And right. how do you – you can't decentralize something by – central like you can't f there's no power play that decentralizes things there's no power play that decentralizes right, things nothing... well yeah there is well uh take schumacher's case so what did he say they ought to do in burma or or well you could do it here is um Basically, a group of people just decide that we're going to, as a group of people, provide for all our economic needs. And we're going to divvy that up and we're going to make stuff and we're going to trade it and that's going to be our economy. That's as decentralized as you can get and that's what Schumacher is saying. Why isn't everybody doing that? Because in the end, it's going to come to that is, yeah, I mean, he is an outlier, don't get me wrong. That's why economists, I, I was absolutely serious. If, if, if you talk Schumacher and his proposal and go to an economist, first thing they're going to say is this is a formula for starvation. 
But as I say, that's kind of ironic because if you live in a rural area, even during the Middle Ages, you didn't starve unless everybody starved. It's people in town that had no food that were starving to death. If you live in the rural area, you got food. You may not have money, but you got food. Um, so from Schumacher's perspective, the question is, what are your values and what's keeping you? And as I say, we, I think every human being has to ask that question about most all their life. What are we doing? What's the value? What makes life significant and meaningful? Um, as I say, the science of economics tells us what's meaningful. I, am I getting at your question? So, I, you know, I mean, each one of us is an individual with these kind of questions. We have to make our own minds. How much time are you going to spend growing vegetables, maybe? How much time are you going to have an animal or two. Everybody, I think, faces that decision. How are we going to, what's the value? Uh, so Wendell Berry is, ah, somebody, yes. is somebody who it seems like has dealt with some of these kind of issues from a uh -huh. very, actually very specifically kind of a Christian uh, perspective and, and of sorts. worldview. Yeah, of sure. Sort, yeah, yes. general worldview. Um, how would you see him in dialogue with uh, Schumacher? Very close, uh, very close. And actually, there's one additional person that if you look in the foreword for both their books, let me see if it's here. Ah, yes. Right here, small is beautiful. The quote's at the beginning. By and large, our present problem is one of attitudes and implements. We are remodeling Alhambra with a steam shovel and are proud of our yardage. We shall hardly relinquish the shovel, which after all has many good points, but we are all in need of a gentler, more objective criteria for its successful use. Aldo Leopold. Aldo Leopold is the ecological foundation of Schumacher and the ecological foundation of Wendell Berry. And he may have been a Christian as well. I'm not sure. And, and one other quick thing. Um, mm -hmm. Schumacher wrote a book um, that I read years ago but really enjoyed called um, A Guide for the Perplexed. Perplexed. Yes. Um, which leads me to, th led me to believe at that time that there is sort of a, a theistic sort of foundation to kind of his thinking. Would you he, say? He became that's a Catholic late in life. Okay. Yeah. And The Guide to the Perplexed, uh, basically that is a book where he took on just materialism and argued against philosophical materialism and argued for Christianity. In the end, I mean, it's not a ex real explicit, but it's a critique of materialism that was the f that's the foundation of all sciences and in particular economics. Hey, Charlie, I got a question. First, thank you. That was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. It was very enlightening and helpful. I want to give you an opportunity to uh, address the uh, economists over at the University of Oregon in the following way. So um, in, um, in, you know, in the Industrial Revolution, the, the population of uh, per capita or per area or something like that started going up mm -hmm. fairly rapidly and, 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 um, and significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, the population was sort of um, more stable, more flat. It was all rural, small village kind of population. We didn't have the Industrial Revolution. So, um, so Malthus and mm -hmm. Schumacher walk into a bar. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. How does that conversation go? <laughs> well, um, in part, well, how it should go is about the assumptions of economics because Malthus uh, holds the same assumptions that Smith does. And Smith holds these classical. Uh, Smith doesn't hold, well, on one hand, 
here's Adam Smith, and this is what bugs the crap out of me. I'm sure nobody's ever read Adam Smith other than me mouth him. Is he lays out the pin factory and says, this is how you make wealth. You can't get around this. This is how it's made. You, you divide this up into mind-numbing exercises and you can make a bunch of money. Well, what Smith said was, well, every government should provide education and stuff for their workers to do because this work is just mind-numbing. They can't do it. It's inhuman. They ought to treat them like humans and, and give them bunches of time off, educate them, teach them trades of stuff they can do because this work is just mind-numbing, it's meaningless, and it's inhuman. That's Adam Smith. I mean, he's not a laissez-faire capitalist that says there's no, there's no role for government at all. In fact, there's a 50-page chapter of the role of government in his book, but it's 600 pages in, so most people probably don't get there. <laughs> but, but the thing about Smith is, Smith is the realist, and Malthus buys all those assumptions. Now, as I say, the critique that Schumacher is going to bring is, yeah, but notice even the title of Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations. Hmm, it's not the well-being of human beings. This is about governments being wealthy and being able to protect themselves and beat the crap out of their neighbors. So, so I, guess, I guess let me refocus the question just okay. a little bit. Um, <laughs> I thought um, I dodged it quite well. <laughs> 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 okay, so the the issue that Malthus was working with, in addition to the assumptions that they had, was um, that the population was more or less on the brink of the large portions of the of the populace was, was more or less on the brink of starvation. You have a famine, you know, these sorts of things. So you get a lot of people who are on the brink of starvation, and um, you know. How much, you know, um, let's see. I think that one of the things that people look to for, say, technology or something like that was to ease starvation and, and death from lack of resources and problems and stuff of that sort. So mm -hmm. I think there's an answer. I just want, I yeah. just think that there, it should be addressed. I mean, yeah. the, yeah, the no. University of Oregon is saying, you know, all the oh, classical economists, all of them, they're saying right. this is a formula for starvation. So Malthus is making the case, if you don't have technology, if you don't have the Industrial Revolution, people are on the brink of starvation. So that's, that's really right. where I'm more well, headed. Well, this is what Schumacher says. Uh, th this is where he would come from on this. And, and it goes back to the economy that we built there, th based on Smith, is before the, you could even have an industrial revolution, agriculture has to improve technologically enough to produce enough food for, to have a surplus for somebody in a city to live. So uh, a revolution in agriculture had to happen prior to the Industrial Revolution, that w which was built on textiles and then on steam and iron and steel. So, so the revolution in agriculture had to happen. Okay, well, the revolution in agriculture happened before the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution, um, it, it does play a role. But what Schumacher would say is, well, and this is actually, Schumacher got this part from another economist, uh, a guy named Karl Polanyi. For those that are around Gutenberg, Michael Polanyi, his brother, is well known. Karl was one of the leading economic historians of the 20th century. And Karl's argument is, is, the Industrial Revolution didn't have to go down the way it went because we were already, the technology was improving foodstuffs so that we, we were providing enough food because if there wasn't enough food and everybody's starving, then there's no Industrial Revolution because nobody's free to do any of that stuff. So the point is the Agricultural Revolution all had to happen before that. But now the question is, okay, so, so now our agriculture is producing enough food. 
what kind of decision do we want to make now? And the decision that was made is the classical economics decision that we're going to go for the heavy industry, we're, we're going to go full out, full bore. Now, I don't know what Smith would say about that. I mean, he lays the foundation and says this is how people are going to get rich, but it's a, it, as a lifestyle, it sucks. So why would anybody want to do that, really? But he laid the foundation with Malthus and Ricardo is built on. Malthus and Ricardo interacted a lot on this stuff. What Schumacher is saying is it didn't have to go down that way. It could have stayed, technology could have stayed small. We could all lived in villages. Uh, it didn't have to happen that cars came along and replaced. Why? We didn't necessarily need to replace horses with tractors. We didn't necessarily have to do that. It would have kept more people in agriculture. But so what? I mean, the issue Schumacher wants to talk about is we're making a decision. We can either have money and stuff or we can live in villages that value families, that value a family as a production unit. This is the unit where stuff is getting made for sale as in a family. Families in the modern economy are just consumption units. All you do is buy stuff. You don't make anything as a family. So what Schumacher wants to say is, is well, that was a human choice. Sure, we will have less stuff, but how much stuff does it really take to live a good life and a meaningful life and a creative life where you're making stuff that you want to make, learning skills and trades instead of mind-numbing work? Is, is that getting that Yeah, way? I think that, that answers it for me. I mean, basically what you're saying is that technology in and of itself is not bad so long as the technology is aimed towards things that are, are meaningful and, and right. good for life. And if, and if we could have a technology that prevents us from being on the, on the verge of starvation all the time, sure. that would allow for, that wouldn't be limited by, say, Malthusian right. kind of principles of, of population control and all that kind so of anyway, stuff So like anyway, look that. at his pump that he designed. People were lifting buckets of water for their rice. He designed a pump that was made out of a bamboo pipe with an Archimedes screw in it that was driven by a, some kind of, I think it was bamboo, it was a wood-like runner. It was on a roller, so you set the bike on it and pedaled. hundred times more efficient being able to move water. Well... He's all for that because it doesn't create catastrophic changes in human society. And what Schumacher looks around and he says, well, uh, I'll, I'll put it in our terms. He, he was very close to saying it, but I'll put it in our terms. For the left is the economic system is run on consumption. We need, a global, we need a global market to provide us with all the stuff that we need. We need an economy that's unrestricted. The only thing we need is for autonomous individuals to be able to buy. Okay? We in particular don't want families, we don't want villages, we don't want any of that stuff. We want autonomous people who can buy. Well, look at the left. And, and let me add this. I, I kind of said it, but I'll say it explicit now. It used to be, what did, what did free will or liberty historically mean? Historically, liberty meant freedom from base instincts. That's what freedom meant. The Enlightenment changed that to freedom means I can choose anything I want, even including base desires. And nature is no limit. We have the technology. The whole goal of this project is for technology to take over control of nature. We aren't even bounded by nature. 
Look at the decisions being made on that side, on the left side. And it's all because our economics is, both of them want autonomous individuals. The left wants a, a big enough government to protect our autonomous rights to choose anything we want to choose within nature or not. Because we have the technology, nature doesn't bound us anymore. The left wants autonomous individuals that we can keep through propaganda and use addict them to buying stuff. Well, what Schumacher is saying is, and look, both sides, neither side wants families, villages, churches, any kind of groups, because all those mitigate against an autonomous individual that's playing the role for either side. Is that, is that making sense? Well, that's where Schumacher is saying, yeah. See, the point is, the economic system built on bigness, built on economy of scale, built on materialism which says all that matters is the total consumption. Well, it destroys human beings, it destroys our communities we live in, it destroys, and, and that was Polanyi's argument, that's Schumacher's argument, is those are the choices we've had to face. And at certain points of time, Large numbers of people in the society made choices. They got out of it. Now, it's hard to get out of it anymore. We don't have frontiers and homesteads and stuff. It's harder for us to deal with it. But it's the same questions. We still have choices. Uh, but the choice is, what do we value? Um, so uh, another theme is, Anybody who lives in and values the modern economy, they're placeless. Why? Because you got to move for your job. You can't live in one place. You got to move for your career. Your career is what your life is about. You're landless. You're placeless. You have no tradition. All those traditions, everything, those are on purpose for, by both sides removed. They want them gone. All they want left is autonomous individuals that either buy stuff or want to live choosing whatever they want to live. Those are the two choices. And both of them are built on those materialistic worldview. That that's all there is, is matter and energy. So there's nothing else. There's no other choice to make, according to them. Does that? Anyway. On... <laughs> waving my arms too long. <laughs>